to be happy about it or, or bummed out, like, I don't want you gambling, but that would be nice, right? Hey, um, I want you guys to open up your Bibles to uh, John 21, please. John 21. Um, I have been getting messages from people that have been asking the questions about um, what do I think about the uh, earthquake in um, New York along with the eclipse? Could this be the end of times? And, and I, don't, I don't know the answers, right? Like there's a lot of people you could study and you could see uh, certain prophetic messages that could come with this and, and the way people look. But there's a lot of people that dive way into this and they put so much time and effort in talking about how it, it is the end of times and, and around. Now, we know that in Scripture, Jesus says, do not worry about these things. Uh, you're going to hear of wars, rumors of wars, uh, plagues, pestilence, and we do. We live these earthquakes. We, we're seeing these things across the world. But he said, do not worry, because the time is not yet. These are just the beginning of birth pains, right? And so what we know is that it is something that is bringing up a, an idea to let us focus on Jesus, maybe a call to repentance, but there's so many people that are out there that just don't know what to do. I'm going to tell you that I always believe that we should study the end times as much as it possibly should drive us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and to be bold with our faith into a world, because if we know the ending of the story, and we don't share that with those that are out there, then we could be at fault with that, and that could be on our shoulders. And We don't need that. We don't want that. But there's a lot of people that sit there in the meantime, and they say, I don't know what to do. Now, I want you to understand what we're about to talk about. Last week was the resurrection and Easter, and now we're looking at, after Jesus has appeared to the disciples a few times uh, this is a time where Jesus is going to appear to them once again. During this time, the disciples don't know what to do. They're in a lost or a stage where they're just confused. What are we going to be doing? What does Jesus have for us? We don't know. And so I want to look at what they do when they don't know what to do. So we're in John chapter 21. And the scriptures are 1 through 19. We're not going to read it all. What we're going to do is we're going to go through piece by piece. And here's what I want to tell you. When you don't know what to do, here is a good thing that you could do. Number one, surround yourself with godly people. Right? Surround yourself with godly people. Look at this in verses 1 through 3 here. John 21, 1 through 3. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called twin, Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two others of the disciples were together. By the way, how would you like to be those two disciples? Goes through all the names, and then he's like, and two other ones. They were there. I'm going fishing, Simon Peter said to them, and they said, we're coming with you, they told him. And they went out and they got to the boat, but that night they caught nothing. During this time, Peter may not realize it, but he is needing his friends. He is confused, he's struggling, he's trying to understand. I want you guys to see the depth of this. This is following Jesus, serving, giving your life in total devotion to him, watching him get up on the cross and die, wondering what the future holds, having him appear to him, having the women come and tell stories of the stones being rolled away, the body being gone, uh, Jesus appearing to him, watching as he appears to them in the rooms around them, showing them who he truly is. Imagine the confusion they must be feeling. During that time, the disciples were kind of huddled together, waiting, wondering what was to happen. And when Peter's getting ready to go out to go fishing, his friends say, we're going with you. As if we're not leaving you. We need each other during this time. We have many people in the church right now that are battling 
very tough things, whether it be loss of loved ones, whether it be going through cancer uh, struggles, whether it be uh, trying to heal from cancer struggles, whether it be those in marriage issues. There are lots of people that are going through tough times. And you know what? We need each other. Amen? We need each other. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good character. You know what that means? If we don't have each other, we could turn to somebody else, and it could be very bad for us. Have you ever heard this statement? You are the sum of the five people you surround yourself with. You are the sum of the five people you surround yourself with. If you are surrounded with negative people all the time, what is that probably going to do to you? You're going to become negative people, right? Yeah? If you're surrounded by car dealers all the time, what are you going to do? Well, I don't want to say what you're going to do, right? No, whoever we're surrounded by, if we're with happy people, it makes us happy. If we're with ambitious people, it makes us happy. If we're successful people, we desire for success. If we're with leaders, we develop leadership. You are the sum of the five people that you surround yourself with. By the way, some of the greatest things I've seen is when people surround themselves with prayer warriors, start praying and be in prayer warriors. We are the sum of the five people that we surround ourselves with. We can either be around godly people or we can be around corrupt people. And either way, it is going to affect our lives. Ecclesiastes 4.9 says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they keep warm, but how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Understanding we need each other. We were meant for relationship. That's even what the Lord said in the garden. It is not good for man to be what? Alone. We were made for that. We're made for fellowship. We're made for this time that we have together. The disciples, in their struggle right now, they need each other. Did you know this is not just spiritually proven? This is not just biblically proven. This is medically science proven. Have you ever heard of this study? There was a study that was done, and they've now uh, went and they've, they've instituted it into all these different areas. And what they call this particular area is called the rescuing hug. Have you ever heard of that? What happens was this. This is how it all came about where they realized the importance of relationship is two babies, uh, twins, were premature. They were born very early. We understand premature. We had a premature child, and, and other people in here have battled it. When you're premature, you're fighting anyways for life, right? It's a struggle. It's hard. Well, these two twins, they both got put in their little incubator units and, and were setting aside, trying to keep them warm, making sure they were okay, snuggled up. But one of them really started having health turn bad and was going to die. The health was dropping quickly, uh, wasn't breathing right. The heart rate wasn't what it needed to be. It was a huge struggle. So one of the nurses went against protocol and she was trying on a last-ditch effort to do something. And what she did was she grabbed the healthy baby and went and put in the incubator with the other one. And the healthy baby snuggled up and even put an arm around the baby. You can see a picture of this if you look it up. And you can read stories. Uh, you can read it in the Mayo, Mayo Clinic stories. You can read it on Time Magazine. You can read about this story. And this baby puts the arm around the other baby, and they're snuggled together. And do you know what ended up happening? The other baby's heart rate started increasing, started breathing better. Started going, why? Because they were made for relationship, and when they had been in the womb together, they helped each other. When the time came and they were out, all of a sudden they were separated, and the one longed for the relationship of the other, and the body was shutting down, needed that rescue touch. A rescuing hug can mean the world to us, amen? 
I mean, it can mean so much to us. We need this. We need the relationship we have. It increases our sense of belonging and purpose when people are around us and they help us out. The Mayo Clinic put out a study about this, and they said it boosts your happiness when you have relationships around you, reduces your stress, improve your self-confidence, your self-worth, help you cope with traumas such as divorce, serious illness, job loss, death of a loved one, encourage you to change or avoid unhealthy lifestyle habits. Except for you guys, I keep having people in Sunday school class, hey, you want a donut? Hey, you want a muffin? None of you guys ever come up, hey, you want a carrot? I don't know. No. We do that because we fellowship with one another. Encourages you to change or avoid those unhealthy lifestyles, such as excessive eating or lack of exercise. We need each other. We need each other. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, Where there is no counsel, the people fail. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Church relationships, Christian relationships, can mean so much. Strengthens us, helps us, encourages us. When the disciples were down, when Jesus was not right there in their presence after they had been with him so long, when he would vanish and be gone after the resurrection, appear to him, be gone again. When they were struggling, what they had was each other. And by the way, even to the point when Jesus ascends to the Father, do you know what happens with the disciples? They united in prayer. They were together and they needed each other. Here's the second thing that you could do while you wait and you don't know what to do. Serve. Amen? Serve. I like verse 4. It says, when daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore. However, the disciples did not know it was Jesus. If you flip over to verse 8 through 10, it says this. But since they were not far from land, about 100 yards away, the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net. Full of fish, when they got out of the land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. I like what the disciples do where Jesus says, bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus told them. So Simon Peter got up, hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. We go out a lot of times and we fish for fun. It's a good way to get out. It's a, a great time, unless you don't know what you're doing, and, and it's horrible. It's a miserable time. But if you know what you're doing, it's a lot of fun. You get out there for activity. Can I ask you something? Is that what they were fishing for? Was it recreation? They were saying they got up, and they could not decide between going and golfing or going and fishing. No. You know what the disciples had to do while they were struggling? They still had to eat. What was Peter's job? He was a fisherman. What was he going to do? He was going to get to go out and go fish, and he was going to bring in food for those that were around and be there. When he didn't know what to do, what he did was he was serving. I don't know, I don't know where God is leading a lot of times, but I do know what to do. When I don't know what the future holds, or I don't know what the current state of life is going to be. I know I'm supposed to be faithful with what I'm doing. I'm supposed to serve. It's what all of us are doing, and every one of us has that ability in our life, that call of us to serve. Peter was a fisherman. By the way, if you looked at the names of these guys on here, it was Peter, Simon Peter. You guys know Simon Peter. He was the, the rock of which the church was built on, right? Which is also a play on words, can mean the pebble of which the church was built on, a small stone, Petra. And here he was, the stone that was there, the fishermen. We have the sons of Zebedee that are part of it. What was their jobs, by the way? Fishermen. You have Nathaniel, and, and remember when Philip brought Nathaniel, or was telling him about Jesus, he says to him that we found uh, Jesus the Nazarene, or that could be the Messiah, and he's from Nazareth, and he says, can anything good come from Nazareth? And then he goes off, and he becomes this powerful man of God following Jesus. When these guys come together, 
They go back to knowing what to do. Serve. All they knew what to do was to go back to what they were, fish and provide for people. They're doing it in the midst. It's what Scripture says. After Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples, he revealed himself to them in this way, and after the revelation of it, it says, I'm going fishing, Simon Peter said. Well, we're coming with you. There's a song by uh, John Waller called While I'm Waiting, and it says this, I'm waiting, I'm waiting on you, Lord. And I'm hopeful, I'm waiting on you, Lord. Though it is painful, but patiently, I will wait. And I will move ahead, bold and confident, taking every step in obedience. While I'm waiting, I will serve you. While I'm waiting, I will worship. While I'm waiting, I will not faint. I will be running the race even while I wait. I don't know when the Lord's coming back. Scripture doesn't make it abundantly clear to us at what time he's coming back. It's, it's hidden from us being able to understand. Because what would happen is many of us would hunker down or we would go out like one church, and a matter of fact, a big church in Amarillo, national news during Y2K. Preacher said that he thought that the end of times was happening that day and Jesus was coming back. And so you know what people did? They went out and they bought Corvettes. They spent all their money. They thought, why not? And you know what? He didn't come back and they're left with a lot of debt and Corvettes and struggles that they can't pay for. Yeah, I can't tell you exactly when he's coming back. And I worry that if we knew, we would just hunker down but we have work to do, amen? Work to do. We need each other while we're waiting and don't know what to do. Surround yourself with godly people while you're waiting and you don't know what to do. Serve. And by the way, if you don't know what to serve, my, Heather tells my kids all the time, see a need, fill a need, right? See a need, fill a need. It's what we're supposed to do. When you see it, fill the need. That's what we're called to do. I don't need a bunch, we say this a lot of times as pastors, we don't need a lot of preachers. Preaching's good, but we don't need a lot of preachers. We don't even need a whole lot of Sunday school teachers. You could have big classes if you wanted to of people that are in there. We could use them, but we don't necessarily need them. You know what a utility player is in baseball? So you can get big, powerful men that can play first base and right field. You can create great fielding that plays shortstop. You can have great pitchers, but do you know what those people are? They're labeled to those positions. A utility person is somebody that can play everywhere. They're not the best at any one thing, but they can be used everywhere. We don't need a bunch of chiefs. We need utility players. See a need, fill a need. Amen? How about this? When you don't know what to do, serve with that gift that you have. Here they are in verse 3. I'm going fishing, Simon Peter says. It's not just serving. He's using his specific gift. We're coming with you, they told him. They went out, they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. When daybreak comes, Jesus stood on the shore. However, the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Men, Jesus called out to them, you don't have any fish, do you? No, they answered. Cast your net on the right side of the boat, he told them, and you will find some. So they did, and they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. The greatest fisherman is not the disciples. The greatest fisherman is Jesus himself, amen? You use the gift that you actually have. If you are sitting there, you see a need, you feel a need, you help out where it needs to be. But I'm going to promise you, as you go through that process, you will start finding exactly where God wants you to serve. When I was in college, I would change my major all the time, trying to find something that interests me, trying to find something I wanted to do, and I just could not seem to be happy. My father took me out. We went to old Hoagie's Deli on Georgia. Do you guys remember Hoagie's Deli? Had the French dip, best French dip in town. Man, now I'm hungry. Best French dip in town. 
And we're sitting outside of it, and I'm talking to him, and I was telling him what I'm going to change my major to, and he starts dying laughing. And I said, what? And he said, God called you into ministry, and everybody can see it but you, and you won't surrender. And I remember just sitting there bawling like a baby. And uh, I went that day. I came here to church, and I went to Brother Randy, and I said, Brother Randy, I've been running from this for a while. I know God has called me to the ministry, and I'm supposed to surrender to it. And uh, so he sat me down and he talked to me and he told me what God was going to do, how we were going to move and serve. And he said that he was going to allow me to be in different areas of ministry and he was going to find those areas that God wanted me to serve. I was going to teach a Sunday school class. I was going to work with children. I was going to serve, clean a little bit, do things that I needed to do. And uh, then he got me to the point of preaching. And I remember going, I don't want to preach. And I got up there to preach. And when I got done, I remember thinking, that's what I'm called to do is to preach. I wouldn't have done it had he not found and directed me to the place that God wanted to use me in my gifting. If you never serve, you're never going to find what God has for you. Luke 5, one. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them, and they were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which is Simon's, and he asked him to put out a little bit from land. As he sat down, he taught the multitudes from the boat, and when he had stopped speaking to them, he said to him, Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon Peter answered and said to the master, we have toiled all night and we've caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down my net. Do you know what he's saying? I'm a fisherman. I know what I'm doing, but all right. You tell me to do it, I'll do it. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And when they came and filled their boats with, or filled their uh, both of their boats, so they began to sink. And when Simon Peter, Peter saw it, he fell down and Jesus and his knees, saying, "Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord." When the time came for Jesus to draw him back, and Peter had went back serving into the exact area he knew what to do. And when Jesus came into him, who knew even better, tells him once again, Simon, cast your net on the other side. Here he was after the resurrection, could have easily have sat there and said, we know what we're doing, we can't even recognize you. But he does what the Lord tells him to do. Because where the Lord guides us, we won't fail. Amen? We surround ourselves with people we love. While we wait, serve. See a need, fill a need. Serve as you develop that. You'll serve with the gift you have. God will use you. While you're waiting, trying to figure out what to do, start finding the obedient area God wants you to use. And then how about this one? Look for the Lord while you wait. While you're waiting, look for him. Verse 6 through 7. Cast the net on the right side of the boat, he told them, and you'll find some. So they did. They were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. Therefore, the disciple, the one Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he tied out his outer garment around him, for he was stripped and he plunged into the sea. Look in verse 12 through 14. It says, Come and have breakfast, Jesus told him. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to him. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. You know, I think a lot of people don't see the Lord because they don't look for the Lord. Right? How often does he try to get our attention? How often does he try to wake us up? There's an earthquake in New York, and all the news media says, there's rarely ever an earthquake in New York. Maybe the Lord's trying to get your attention. There's an eclipse that's coming. Oh, we're going to go outside and burn our eyes looking at it. Maybe realize the marvel of what God has done to try to get our attention. 
We don't understand and we struggle. God is trying to get our attention. Many times we go out through the days, and I'm talking as Christians, and we do not have eyes to see. That used to be such a big prayer, and I need to get back to it. Lord, give me eyes to see what it is that you want. You know how many times I've sat there and, and I've been at, at restaurants where God has moved because I used to ask the Lord so clearly, God, give me eyes to see. God, I want to see what we should be doing. We should be looking for the Lord in all we have, in opportunities around us, seeking him while we're serving, searching for him. Lord, direct me. Lord, show me. I want to see what it is that you have for me, Lord. Show me. Make it clear to me what I should be doing. I like how Simon Peter, when his eyes are open, he makes it so much, so clear to him that it's Jesus, that what he does is he gets and he swims to Jesus, goes as fast as he can to get in the presence of Jesus. He had been looking for him. He sees him and he runs to him. We need our eyes opened to see the things that God has for us. Sometimes we have to surround ourselves with godly people to help remind us about that. Sometimes we have to get into just serving that we see a need, we meet a need, we get in, we try to do what we're supposed to do. Sometimes we get into that area of while we're doing that, God starts directing us and calling us, but we can go through all those areas of serving, being with people around us, and never truly focusing on what God has for us. There's so many times I've heard preachers that get up there and say, I preached, but it's like I almost didn't believe what I was preaching. Heard a worship leader one time at a mega church in Colorado tell me this story. He said, I get up there. He said, I'm so gifted in my talent of what I can do. And he said, I'm not saying that to brag. I'm just telling that I have my praise bands. I have four praise teams. Each one of them will get up on stage when the time comes. They've practiced throughout the week. I've given them music. And I get in there. They have people that fill in for me. I get in there right when the worship time starts. I get on there and I worship right when it's done. I leave and I go home. He said, I don't think I've prayed in years. I get up there and I put on a good show and everybody applauds. They rock out and think it's so great. But I just, I don't even see them. I don't even see them. Because he's not looking for him. You can do a bunch of things and not truly do it for the glory of God. Great preachers, there's three preachers that surrendered to the same time Billy Graham did. Many of them would go off and do crusades and preach all over. One of them admitted that he preached for years, had many people come forward, and he didn't even believe in Jesus. We need our eyes open to look for the things of Jesus, to search for him. Amen? And then how about this? While you're waiting, surround yourself with godly people. While you're waiting, serve. While you're waiting, serve with the gift you have. While you're waiting, look for the Lord. While you're waiting, listen for the Lord. This is a big, serious part of this sermon. And it's in verse 15. It says this. When they had eaten breakfast... Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told him. A second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told him. He asked him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he asked him a third time, do you love him? Do you know why he was grieved with that? Because he remembers back a story, something that happened just days before, where Jesus was telling them that one would betray him, and he was saying, I won't betray you, I will stand with you. No matter what happens, I'll stand with you. And he says, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, and then he tells him, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. 
two arguments that are made about it. One could be a literal rooster crow in the morning. Another was a, a horn that was cowed called the rooster's crow. Whatever it was, whether it was mmm or whether it was cock-a-doodle-doo, he denied them three times, right? The third time Jesus says, do you love me? He knows what he's doing. Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus says. I assure you when you were young, you would tie your belt, you'd walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you're going to stretch out your hands and somebody else will tie you and they will carry you where you don't want to go. He said this to signify by what kind of death he would glorify him. And after saying this, he told them, follow me. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I will go wherever you tell me to go. You're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. Fast forward, here he is standing in his Peter. Simon, or standing again. Simon, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Simon, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Simon, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then what you're going to do is you're going to follow me. And where you denied me before because you were afraid of death, you're going to follow me and they're going to lead you to death. But you stay obedient. Listen to what I'm saying. By the way, it did happen. Here he was being crucified. Story says, legend says, history says that it was him being crucified with his wife, but we don't know which one was really going first. And while they were going, they were yelling to the other ones to be faithful, yelling to the crowd to turn to Jesus, repent and run to him. While he denied him whenever he was afraid, he stood bold when death was actually coming. Because he understood how great God's forgiveness was. He understood. He understood. If you listen to the Lord, he's going to lead you to do things that you can't even imagine. To forgive in ways you never thought you would be able to. To serve in magnificent ways. If you will listen to him, the Lord will direct you and guide you. There was a story that happened, a a true story. This man was a youth pastor in a town. They had a few kids. I think they had two boys and an older daughter. And uh, the older daughter started getting in trouble. There was a rebel boy in town that that just kept flirting with her and coming, and the girl was taken with him so much. He was different than all the other boys in church. He, He had that kind of bad boy vibe and was really drawn to it. She liked that it was different, different than her father, different than the people around And they started going off and sneaking out together. And the father found out and said, you're forbidden from talking to me. They put the rules in and she would sneak out more, made it more rebellious, started running from the Lord and turning from him. And uh, uh, they go in as the relationships get deeper and deeper and the father causing all this issue between them. One night, while they're asleep, a back door is unlocked. The man comes in with another friend. And they kill the two younger brothers. They go into the bedroom where the mother and the father are, and they shoot them. The mother dies, but the father lives. You can hear as he hears the shots, his younger sons calling out, no, no, and they're crying. You know who it was that actually shot him? The sister. The man gets out. They try to burn the house down. He gets out the father. He knows his wife is dead. He knows that his two sons are dead. And he starts crawling, trying to live. He runs to the next door neighbors as he crawls there. And you can actually listen to the 911 call that was called. And they're calling saying, there's shots next door. And they hear the man on the phone. He's like, my wife is dead. The house is on fire. You can hear him. What ends up happening is they arrest the man and they arrest the girl because they go off to a hotel doing bad things. They go and they arrest them that night. They bring them to jail. When the time comes for punishment to be cast, the man had been so overtaken by God's love that he stands up when his daughter's being sentenced and he says, I'm asking God, to show me how to forgive. And I'm asking you, judge, to show lenience on her. Please, please don't do this. And the judge said that they had to sentence her. The man would go 
and he would visit his daughter all the time and share the love of Jesus and, and would make this effort. The woman who killed his wife, that killed his sons, he would do this. Now you would say, well, I kind of understand that's his daughter. But during the trial where they were going to sentence the man, he stood up and he said, if I can ask for forgiveness for my daughter, and if the Lord can give that to me, then judge, I forgive this man and I'm asking you to show leniency. And do you know what he would do? He would go visit that man in prison like every week. The man that killed his wife and his kids. The man that helped lead his daughter astray. He would show forgiveness and try to help direct that man to the Lord. Or a friend of mine that was shot by a man doing his duty while he was a police officer and, and almost dies. And when the day comes that they're going to sentence the man, he asks the judge for five minutes with him. The judge says, I can't give you five minutes with the man. He said, please do. He goes and he helps lead the man to the Lord. What in the world could lead somebody to have that kind of forgiveness? Well, it's when they realize how great they've been forgiven. When they didn't know what to do, all they knew to do was to listen to the Lord and love like he loved. I know. In a moment's time, the trumpet could sound. I know. Or it could be a hundred years from now. I don't know. But in the meantime, when you don't know what to do, how about just listen to the Lord and follow him? Show up to church because God tells us to. Be surrounded by people that love you. Serve. If you see a need, meet the need. Find the gifting that God has for you, has you serve, and be used for his glory. Look for the Lord in all things in your daily life and listen to what God has for you. I promise his way is greater than your way. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, I pray for those that are here, that maybe they're struggling with this right now, that, that they feel like they're just in a rut, they don't know what to do. Well, God, I, I pray that they will serve. They see a need, they'll meet a need. God, I pray that as they do that, that they will grow in you, and they'll find that exact area that you have for them. Lord God, I pray that they will look for you in all their ways. Everywhere they'll go, they'll look for direction that you have for them, that they will listen to you, whether it be through the words, through the actual scripture, whether it be through prayer, that they will listen to what you have to say to them. Those things, those things are things that we're called to do. We're supposed to. God, we also need to realize how desperately we need each other. We're made for relationship. It's what a church is. Relationship. Lord God, I ask you to be with us right now. That you would draw us to you. Where we feel alone, that we'll realize how much we need each other that through our situations we'll look to you. Or maybe there's people in here that just need to serve. God, give them that boldness to come forward and say, here I am, use me. Lord, draw us to you right now. In Jesus' name.